Part 6 of The Life of St. Anthony by St. Athanasius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 64. And another, a person of rank, came to him, possessed by a demon. And the demon was so terrible that the man possessed did not know that he was coming to Anthony, but he even ate the excreta from his body. So those who brought him besought Anthony to pray for him. And Anthony, pitying the young man, prayed and kept watch with him all night. And about dawn, the young man suddenly attacked Anthony, and gave him a push. But when those who came with him were angry, Anthony said, Do not be angry with the young man, for it is not he, but the demon which is in him. And being rebuked and commanded to go into dry places, the demon became raging mad, and he has done this. Wherefore, give thanks to the Lord, for his attack on me thus is a sign of the departure of the evil spirit. When Anthony had said this, straightway the young man had become whole, and having come at last to his right mind, knew where he was, and saluted the old man, and give thanks to God. 65. And many monks have related with the greatest agreement and unanimity that many other such like things were done by him. But still these do not seem as marvelous as certain other things appear to be. For once, when about to eat, having risen up to pray about the ninth hour, he perceived that he was caught up in the spirit. And, wonderful to tell, he stood and saw himself, as it were, from outside himself, and that he was led in the air by certain ones. Next, certain bitter and terrible beings stood in the air and wished to hinder him from passing through. But when his conductors opposed him, they demanded whether he was not accountable to them. And when they wished to sum up the account from his birth, Anthony's conductors stopped them, saying, The Lord has wiped out the sins from his birth, but from the time he became a monk, and devoted himself to God, it is permitted you to make a reckoning. Then when they accused him and could not convict him, his way was free and unhindered, and immediately he saw himself, as it were, coming and standing by himself, and again he was Anthony as before. Then forgetful of eating, he remained the rest of the day, and through the whole of the night groaning and praying. For he was astonished when he saw against what mighty opponents our wrestling is, and by what labors we have to pass through the air. And he remembered that this is what the apostle said, according to the prince of the power of the air, for in it the enemy has power to fight and to attempt to hinder those who pass through. Wherefore most earnestly he exhorted, Take up the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, that the enemy, having no evil thing to say against us, may be ashamed. And we who have learned this, let us be mindful of the apostle when he says, Whether in the body I know not, or whether out of the body I know not, God knows. But Paul was caught up unto the third heaven, and having heard things unspeakable, he came down. While Anthony thought that he had come to the air, and contended until he was free. 66. And he had also this favor granted him. For as he was sitting alone on the mountain, if ever he was in perplexity in his meditations, this was revealed to him by providence in prayer. And the happy man, as it is written, was taught of God. After this, when he once had a discussion with certain men who had come to him concerning the state of the soul, and of what nature its place will be after his life. The following night, one from above called him, saying, Anthony, rise, go out, and look. Having gone out therefore, for he knew whom he ought to obey, looking up, he behold one standing and reaching to the clouds, tall, hideous, and fearful, and others ascending as though they were winged. And the figure stretched forth his hand, and some of those who were ascending were stayed by him, while others flew above, and having escaped heavenward, were borne aloft free from care. At such, therefore, the giant gnashed his teeth, but rejoiced over those who fell back, and forthwith a voice came to Anthony, Understandest thou what thou see? And his understanding was open, and he understood that it was the passing of souls, and that the tall being who stood was the enemy who envies the faithful, and those whom he caught and stopped from passing through are accountable to him while those whom he was unable to hold as they passed upward had not been subservient to him. So having seen this, and as it were being reminded, he struggled the more daily to advance towards those things which were before. 
and these visions he was unwilling to tell but as he spent much time in prayer and was amazed when those who were with him pressed him with questions and forced him he was compelled to speak as a father who cannot withhold aught from his children and he thought that as his conscience was clear the account would be beneficial for them that they might learn that discipline bore good fruit and that visions were oftentimes the solace of their labors sixty seven added to this he was tolerant in disposition and humble in spirit for though he was such a man he observed the rule of the church most rigidly and was willing that all clergy should be honored above himself for he was not ashamed to bow his head to bishops and presbyters and if ever a deacon came to him for help he discoursed with him on what was profitable but gave place to him in prayer not being ashamed to learn himself for often he would ask questions and desired to listen to those who were present and if anyone said anything that was useful he confessed that he was profited and besides his countenance had a great and wonderful grace his gift also he had from the saviour for if he were present in a great company of monks and anyone who did not know him previously wished to see him immediately coming forward he passed by the rest and hurried to anthony as though attracted by his appearance yet neither in height nor breadth was he conspicuous above others but in the serenity of his manner and the purity of his soul for as his soul was free from disturbances his outward appearance was calm so from the joy of his soul he possessed a cheerful countenance and from his bodily movements could be perceived the condition of his soul as it is written when the heart is merry the countenance is cheerful but when it is sorrowful it is cast down thus jacob recognized the counsel laban had in his heart and said to his wives the countenance of your father is not as it was yesterday and the day before thus samuel recognized david for he had merciful eyes and teeth white as milk thus anthony was recognized for he was never disturbed for his soul was at peace he was never downcast for his mind was joyous sixty eight and he was altogether wonderful in face and religious for he never held communion with the Miletian schismatics knowing their wickedness and apostasy from the beginning nor had he friendly dealings with the Manichans or any other heretics for if he had only as far as advice that they would change to pity for he thought and asserted that intercourse with these was harmful and destructive to the soul in the same manner also he loathed the heresy of the arians and exhorted all neither to approach them nor to bold their erroneous belief and once when certain arian madmen came to him when he had questioned them and learned their impiety he drove them from the mountain saying that their words were worse than the poison of serpents sixty nine and once also the arians having lyingly asserted that anthony's opinion were the same as theirs he was displeased and rose against them then being summoned by the bishops and all the brethren he descended from the mountain and having entered alexandria he denounced the arians saying that their heresy was the last of all and the forerunner of antichrist and he taught the people that the son of god was not a created being neither had he come into being from non-existence but that he was the eternal word and wisdom of the essence of the father and therefore it was impious to say there was a time when he was not for the word was always coexistent with the father wherefore have no fellowship with the most impious arians for there is no communion between light and darkness for you are good christians but they when they say that the son of the father the word of god is a created being differ in not from the heathen since they worship that which is created rather than god the creator but believe ye that the creation itself is angry with them because they number the creator the lord of all by whom all things came into being was those things which were originated seventy all the people therefore rejoiced when they heard the anti-christian heresy anathematized by such a man and all the people in the city ran together to see anthony and the greeks and those who are called their priests came into the church saying we ask to see the man of god for so they all called him for in that place also the lord cleansed many of demons and healed those who were mad and many greeks asked that they might even but touch the old man believing that they should be profited 
Assuredly, as many became Christians in those days, as one would have seen made in a year. Then when some thought that he was troubled by the crowds, and on this account turned them all away from him, he said undisturbingly that there were not more of them than of the demons with whom he wrestled in the mountain. 71. But when he was departing, and were sitting him forth on his way, as we arrived at the gate, a woman from behind cried out, Stay thou, man of God, my daughter is grievously vexed by a devil. Stay, I beseech thee, lest I too harm myself was running. And the old man, when he heard her, and was asked by us, willingly stayed. And when the woman drew near, the child was cast on the ground. But when Anthony had prayed, and called upon the name of Christ, the child was raised whole, for the unclean spirit was gone forth, and the mother blessed God, and all gave thanks, and Anthony himself also rejoiced, departing to the mountain as though it were to his own home. 72. And Anthony also was exceeding prudent, and the wonder was that, although he had not learned letters, he was a ready-witted and sagacious man. At all events, two Greek philosophers once came, thinking they could try their skill on Anthony, and he was in the outer mountain. And having recognized who they were from their appearance, he came to them and said to them by means of an interpreter, Why, philosophers, did ye trouble yourself so much to come to a foolish man? And when they said he was not a foolish man, but exceedingly prudent, he said to them, If you come to a foolish man, your labor is superfluous. But if you think me prudent, become as I am, for we ought to imitate what is good. And if I had come to you, I should have imitated you. But if you to me, become as I am, for I am a Christian. But they departed with wonder, for they saw that even demons feared Anthony. 73. And again others such as these met him in the outer mountain, and thought to mock him, because he had not learned letters. And Anthony said to them, what say ye? Which is first, mind or letters? And which is the cause of which, mind of letters or letters of mind? And when they answered, Mind is first, and the inventor of letters, Anthony said, Whoever therefore has a sound mind has not need of letters. This answer amazed both the bystanders and the philosophers, and they departed, marveling that they had seen so much understanding in an ignorant man for his manners were not rough as though he had been reared in the mountain, and there grown old, but graceful and polite, and his speech was seasoned with the divine salt, so that no one was envious, but rather all rejoiced over him who visited him. 74. After this again certain others came, and these were men who were deemed wise among the Greeks, and they asked him a reason for our faith in Christ. But when they attempted to dispute concerning the preaching of the divine cross, and meant to mock, Anthony stopped for a little, and first pitying their ignorance said, through an interpreter, who could skillfully interpret his words? Which is more beautiful, to confess the cross, or to attribute to those whom you call gods adultery and the seduction of boys? For that which is chosen by us is a sign of courage, and a sure token of the contempt of death while yours are the passions of licentiousness. Next, which is better, to say that the word of God was not changed, but being the same, he took a human body for the salvation and well-being of man, that having shared in human birth, he might make man partake in the divine and spiritual nature, or to liken the divine to senseless animals, and consequently to worship four-footed beasts, creeping things, and the likeness of men. For these things are the objects of reverence of you wise men. But how do you dare to mock us? Who say that Christ has appeared as man? Seeing that you, bringing the soul from heaven, assert that it has strayed and fallen from the vault of the sky into body. And would that you had said that it had fallen into human body alone, and not asserted that it passes and changes into four-footed beasts and creeping things. For our faith declares that the coming of Christ was for the salvation of men. But you err because you speak of soul, as non-generated, and we, considering the power and loving kindness of providence, think that the coming of Christ in the flesh was not impossible with God. But you, although calling the soul the likeness of mind, connect it with false and feign in your myth that it is changeable, and consequently introduce the idea 
that mind itself is changeable by reason of the soul. For whatever is the nature of a likeness, such necessarily is the nature of that of which it is a likeness. But whenever you think such a thought concerning mind, remember that you blaspheme even the father of mind himself. 75. But concerning the cross, which would you say to be the better? To bear it when a plot is brought about by wicked men, nor to be in fear of death, brought about under any form whatever, or to prate about the wanderings of Osiris and Isis, the plots of Typhon, the flight of Cronus, his eating his children, and the slaughter of his father. For this is your wisdom. But how, if you mock the cross, do you not marvel at the resurrection? For the same men who told us of the latter wrote the former. Or why, when you make mention of the cross, are you silent about the dead who were raised, the blind who received their sight, the paralytics who were healed, the lepers who were cleansed, the walking upon the sea, and the rest of the signs and wonders, which show that Christ is no longer a man, but God? To me you seem to do yourselves much injustice, and not to have carefully read our scriptures, but read and see that the deeds of Christ prove him to be God, came upon earth for the salvation of men. 76. But do you tell us your religious beliefs? What can you say of senseless creatures, except senselessness and ferocity? But if, as I hear, you wish to say that these things are spoken of by you as legends, and you allegorize the rape of the maiden, Persephone of the earth, the lameness of Hephaestus of fire, and allegorize the air as Hera, the sun as Apollo, the moon as Artemis, and the sea as Poseidon, none the less, you do not worship God himself, but serve the creature rather than God, who created all things. For if because creation, beautiful you compose such legends, still it was fitting that you should stop short at admiration and not make gods of things created, so that you should not give the honor of the creator to that which is created. Since if you do, it is time for you to divert the honor of the master builder to the house built by him, and of the general to the soldier, what then can you reply to these things, that we may know whether the cross has anything worthy of mockery? 77. But when they were at a loss, turning hither and thither, Anthony smiled and said, again through an interpreter, Sight itself carries the convention of these things. But as you prefer to lean upon demonstrative arguments, and as you, having this art, wish us also not to worship God, until after such proof, do you tell first how things in general and specially the recognition of God are accurately known? Is it through demonstrative argument or the working of faith? And which is better, faith which comes through the inworking of God, or demonstration by arguments? And when they answered that faith which comes through the inworking was better and was accurate knowledge, Anthony said, You have answered well. For faith arises from disposition of soul, but dialectic from the skill of its inventors. Wherefore, to those who have the inworking through faith, demonstrative argument is needless, or even superfluous. For what we know through faith, this you attempt to prove through words. And often you are not even able to express what we understand, so the inworking through faith is better and stronger than your professional arguments. 78. We Christians, therefore, hold the mystery not in the wisdom of Greek arguments, but in the power of faith, richly supplied to us by God through Jesus Christ. And to show that this statement is true, behold now, without having learned letters, we believe in God, knowing through his works his providence over all things. And to show that our faith is effective, so now we are supported by faith in Christ, but you by professional logo machines. The portents of the idols among you are being done away, but our faith is extending everywhere. You, by your arguments and quibbles, have converted none from Christianity to paganism. We, teaching the faith on Christ, expose your superstition, since all recognize that Christ is God, and the Son of God. You, by your eloquence, do not hinder the teaching of Christ, but we, by the mention of Christ crucified, put all demons to flight whom you fear, as if they were gods. Where the sign of the cross is, magic is weak, and witchcraft has no strength. 79. 
Tell us, therefore, where your oracles are now. Where are the charm of the Egyptians? Where the delusions of the magicians? Where did all these things cease and grow weak, except when the cross of Christ arose? Is it then a fit subject for mockery, and not rather the things brought to naught by it, and convicted of weakness? For this is a marvelous thing, that your religion was never persecuted, but even was honored by men in every city, while the followers of Christ are persecuted, and still our side flourishes and multiplies over yours. What is yours, though praised and honored, perishes, while the face and teaching of Christ, though mocked by you and often persecuted by kings, has filled the world. For when has the knowledge of God so shone forth? Or when has self-control and the excellence of virginity appeared as now? Or when has death been so despised except when the cross of Christ has appeared? And this no one doubts when he sees the martyr despising death for the sake of Christ. When he sees for Christ's sake the virgins of the church, keeping themselves pure and undefiled. End of part 6
and his companions perceived that he was seeing a vision for often when he was on the mountains he saw what was happening in egypt and told it to serapion the bishop who was indoors with him and who saw that anthony was wrapped in a vision once he was sitting and working he fell as it were into a trance and groaned much at what he saw then after a time having turned to the bystanders with groans and trembling he prayed and falling on his knees remained so a long time and having arisen the old man wept his companions therefore trembling and terrified desired to learn from him what it was and they troubled him much until he was forced to speak and with many groans he spoke as follows o my children it were better to die before it has appeared in the vision come to pass and when again they asked him having burst into tears he said grass is about to seize a church and it is at the point of being given up to men who are like senseless beasts for i saw the table of the lord's house and mules standing around it on all sides in a ring and kicking the things therein just like a herd kicks when it leaps in confusion and you saw said he how i groan for i heard a voice saying my altar shall be defiled these things the old man saw and after two years the present inroad of the aryans and the plunder of the church took place when they violently carried off the vessels and made the heathen carry them and when they forced the heathen from the prisons to join in the services and in their presence did upon the table as they would then we all understood that these kicks of the mules signified to anthony what the aryans senselessly like beasts are now doing but when he saw the vision he comforted those with him saying be not downcast my children for as the lord has been angry so again will he heal us and the church shall soon again receive her own order and shall shine forth as she is wont and you shall behold the persecuted restored and wickedness again was drawn to its own hiding place and pious face speaking boldly in every place was all freedom only defile not yourselves was the arians for their teaching is not that of the apostles but that of demons and their father the devil yea rather it is barren and senseless and without light understanding like the senselessness of these mules eighty three such are the words of anthony and we ought not to doubt whether such marvels were wrought by the hand of a man for it is the promise of the saviour when he says if ye have face as a grain of mustard seed you shall say to this mountain remove hence and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you and again verily verily i say unto you if ye shall ask the father in my name he will give it to you ask and ye shall receive and he himself it is who says to his disciples and to all who believe on him heal the sick cast out demons freely ye have received freely give eighty four anthony at any rate healed not by commanding but by prayer and speaking the name of christ so that it was clear to all that it was not he himself who worked but the lord who showed mercy by his means and healed the sufferers but anthony's part was only prayer and discipline for the sake of which he stayed in the mountain rejoicing in the contemplation of divine things but grieving when troubled by much people and dragged to the outer mountain for all judges used to ask him to come down because it was impossible for them to enter on account of their following of litigants but nevertheless they asked him to come that they might but see him when therefore he avoided it and refused to go to them they remained firm and sent to him all the more the prisoners under charge of soldiers that on account of these he might come down being forced by necessity and seeing them lamenting he came into the outer mountain and again his labor was not unprofitable for his coming was advantageous and serviceable to many and he was of profit to the judges counseling them to prefer justice to all things to fear god and to know that with what judgment they judge they should be judged but he loved more than all things his sojourn into the mountain eighty five at another time suffering the same compulsion at the hands of them who had need and after many entreaties from the commander of the soldiers he came down and when he was come he spoke to them shortly of the things which make for salvation and concerning those who wanted him and was hastening away but when the duke as he is called entreated him to stay he replied that he could not linger among them and persuaded him by pretty simile saying fishes if they remain long on dry land die and so monks lose their strength if they loiter among you and spend their time with you wherefore as fish must hurry to the sea 
so must we hasten to the mountain, lest haply, if we delay, we forget the things within us. And the general, having heard this and many other things from him, was amazed and said, Of a trust this man is a servant of God, for unless he were beloved of God, whence could an ignorant man have such great understanding? 86. And a certain general, Balakius by name, persecuted us Christians bitterly on account of his regard for the Arians, that name of ill omen, and his ruthlessness was so great that he beat virgins and stripped and scourged monks. Anthony at this time wrote a letter as follows, and sent it to him, I see wrath coming upon thee, wherefore, cease to persecute the Christians, lest haply wrath catch hold of thee, and even now it is on the point of coming upon thee. But Balacius laughed, and threw the letter on the ground, and spit on it, and insulted the bearers, bidding them tell this to Anthony, since thou takest thought for the monk, soon I will come after thee also. And five days had not passed before Ras came upon him. For Balacius and Nestorius, the perfect of Egypt, went forth to the first halting place from Alexandria, which is called Shiro, and both were on the horseback, and the horses belonged to Balacius, and were the quietest of all his stable. But they had not gone far towards the palace, when the horses began to frisk with one another, as they are wont to do. And suddenly the quieter on which Nestorius sat, with a bite dismounted Balacius and attacked him, and tore his thigh so badly with its teeth that he was borne straight back to the city, and in three days died, and all wondered because what Anthony had foretold had been so speedily fulfilled. 87. Thus, therefore, he warned the crew, but the rest who came to him he so instructed that they straightway forget their lawsuits, and felicitated those who were in retirement from the world, and he championed those who were wrong in such a way that you would imagine that he, not the others, was a sufferer. Further, he was able to be of such use to all that many soldiers and men who had great possessions laid aside the burdens of life and became monks for the rest of their days. And it was as if a physician had been given by God to Egypt. For who in grief met Anthony and did not return rejoicing? Who came mourning for his dead and did not forthwith put off his sorrow? Who came in anger and was not converted to friendship? What poor and low-spirited man met him, who, hearing him and looking upon him, did not despise wealth and console himself in his poverty? What monk, having been neglectful, came to him and became not all the stronger? What young man, having come to the mountain and seen Anthony, did not forthwith deny himself pleasure and love temperance, who, when tempted by a demon, came to him and did not find rest, and who came troubled with doubts and did not get quietness of mind? 88. For this was the wonderful thing in Anthony's discipline, that, as I said before, having the gift of discerning spirits, he recognized their movements, and was not ignorant whether any of them turned his energy and made his attack. And not only was he not deceived by them himself, but cheering those who were troubled with doubts, he taught them how to defeat their plans, telling them of the weakness and craft of those who possessed them. Thus each one, as though prepared by him for battle, came down from the mountain, braving the designs of the devil and his demons. How many maidens who had suitors, having but seen Anthony from afar, remained maidens for Christ's sake? And people came also from foreign parts to him, and like all others, having got some benefit returned, as though set forward by a father. And certainly when he died, all as having been bereft of a father, consoled themselves solely by the remembrances of him, preserving at the same time his counsel and advice. 89. It is worse while that I should relate, and that you, as you wish, should hear what his death was like, for this end of his is worthy of imitation. According to his custom, he visited the monks in the outer mountain, and having learned from Providence that his own end was at hand, he said to the brethren, This is my last visit to you which I shall make and I shall be surprised if we see each other again in this life. At length the time of my departure is at hand, for I am near a hundred and five years old. And when they heard it, they wept and embraced, and kissed the old man. But he, as though sailing from a foreign city to his own, spoke joyously, and exhorted them, not to grow idle in their labors, nor to become faint in their training, 
but to live as though dying daily, and as he had said before, zealously to guard the soul from foul thoughts, eagerly to imitate the saints, and to have not to do with malicious schismatics, for you know their wicked and profane character, nor have any fellowship with the Arians, for the impiety is clear to all, nor be disturbed if you see the judges protect them, for it shall cease, for their pomp is mortal and of short duration. Wherefore, keep yourselves all the more untainted by them, and observe the traditions of the fathers, and chiefly the holy face in our Lord Jesus Christ, which you have learned from the scripture, and of which you have often been put in mind by me. 90. But when the brethren were urging him to abide with them, and there to die, he suffered, it not for many reasons, as he showed by keeping silence, and especially for this, the Egyptians are wont to honor with funeral rites, and to wrap in linen clothes at death, the body of good men, and especially of the holy martyrs, and not to bury them underground, but to place them on couches, and to keep them in their houses, thinking in this to honor the departed. And Anthony often urged the bishops to give commandment to the people on this matter. In like manner he taught the laity, and reproved the woman, saying, that this thing was neither lawful nor holy at all, for the bodies of the patriarchs and prophets are until now preserved in tombs, and the very body of the Lord was laid in a tomb, and a stone was laid upon it, and hid it until he rose on the third day. And thus saying, he showed that he who did not bury the bodies of the dead after death transgressed the law, even though they were sacred. For what is greater or more sacred than the body of the Lord? Many therefore, having heard, henceforth buried the dead underground, and gave thanks to the Lord that they had been taught rightly. 91. But he, knowing the custom, and fearing that his body would be treated this way, hastened, and having bidden farewell to the monks in the outer mountain, entered the inner mountain, where he was accustomed to abide. And after a few months he fell sick. Having summoned those who were there, they were two in number who had remained in the mountain fifteen years, practicing the discipline, and attending on Anthony on account of his age. He said to them, I, as it is written, go the way of the fathers, for I perceive that I am called by the Lord. And do you be watchful and destroy not your long discipline, but as though now making a beginning, zealously preserve your determination, for ye know the treachery of the demons, how fierce they are, but how little power they have. Wherefore, fear them not, but rather, ever breathe Christ and trust him. Live as though dying daily, give heed to yourselves, and remember the admonition you have heard from me. Have no fellowship with the schismatics, nor any dealings at all with the heretical Arians, for you know how I shunned them on account of their hostility to Christ, and the strange doctrines of their heresy. Therefore, be the more earnest always to be followers first of God and then of the saints, that after death they also may receive you as well-known friends into the eternal habitations. Ponder over these things and think of them, and if you have any care for me, and are mindful of me as of a father, suffer no one to take my body into Egypt, lest haply they place me in the houses, for to avoid this I entered into the mountain and came here. Moreover, you know how I always put to rebuke those who had this custom, and exhorted them to cease from it. Bury my body, therefore, and hide it underground yourselves, and let my words be observed by you that no one may know the place but you alone. For at the resurrection of the dead I shall receive it incorruptible from the Saviour, and divide my garments. To Athanasius the bishop, give one sheepskin, and the garment whereon I am laid, which he himself gave me new, but which with me has grown old. To Serapion the bishop, give the other sheepskin, and keep the hair garments yourself. For the rest fare ye well, my children, for Anthony is departing, and is with you no more. 92. Having said this, when they had kissed him, he lifted up his feet, and as though he saw friends coming to him and was glad because of them, for as he lay his countenance appeared joyful. He died and was gathered to the fathers, and they afterward, according to his commandment, wrapped him up and buried him, hiding his body underground, and no one knows to this day where it was buried, save those two only. But each of those who received the sheepskin of the blessed Anthony and the garment worn by him guards it as a precious treasure, for even to look on them is as it were to behold Anthony, and he who is clothed in them 
it seems was joy to bear his admonitions. 93. This is the end of Anthony's life, in the body, and the above was the beginning of the discipline. Even if this account is small compared with his merit, still from this reflect how great Anthony, the man of God, was, who from his youth to so great an age preserved a uniform zeal for the discipline, and neither through old age was subdued by the desire of costly food, nor through the infirmity of his body changed the fashion of his clothing, nor washed even his feet with water, and yet remained entirely free from harm. For his eyes were undimmed, and quite sound, and he saw clearly. Of his teeth he had not lost one, but they had become worn to the gums, through the great age of the old man. He remained strong both in hands and feet, and while all men were using various foods and washings and divers garments, he appeared more cheerful and of greater strength, and the fact that his fame has been blazoned everywhere, that all regard him was wonder, and that those who have never seen him long for him, is clear proof of his virtue and God's love of his soul. For not from writings, nor from worldly wisdom, nor through any art was Anthony renowned, but solely from his piety towards God. That this was the gift of God no one will deny, for from whence into Spain and into Gaul, how into Rome and Africa was the man heard of who abode hidden in a mountain, unless it was God who maketh his own known everywhere, who also promised this to Anthony at the beginning. For even if they work secretly, even if they wish to remain in obscurity, yet the Lord chose them as lambs to lighten all, that those who hear may thus know that the precepts of God are able to make men prosper, and thus be zealous in the path of virtue. 94. Read these words, therefore, to the rest of the brethren, that they may learn what the life of monks ought to be, and may believe that our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ glorifies those who glorify him, and leads those who serve him unto the end, not only to the kingdom of heaven, but here also, even though they hide themselves, and are desirous of withdrawing from the world, makes them illustrious, and well known everywhere on account of their virtue and the help they render others. And if need be, read this among the heathen, that even in this way they may learn that our Lord Jesus Christ is not only God and Son of God, but also that the Christians who truly serve him and religiously believe on him prove not only that the demons whom the Greeks themselves think to be gods are no gods, but also tread them on their foot and put them to flight, as deceivers and corruptors of mankind. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. End of part seven. Recording by Ephalteus. End of Life of Saint Anthony by Saint Athanasius of Alexandria. Translated by H. Ellershaw.